Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eivind Fylling Jensen. I'm the CEO of Nofima, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you, both you present here at uh, Aquanur in Trondheim, and those of you following this seminar uh, at your screen at, uh, screen at home, to this very challenging uh, topic, which is where biology meets technology. In previous meetings, I've said that it's uh, no way that you can fuel biology by technology or money. It has to be a cooperation between the two. And to lead us through today's seminar, the, the head of the aquaculture division at Nofima, Bente Torstensen, will lead you through. Bente, the word is yours. And thank you for being here, all of you. It's nice seeing you in 3D and not only on a flat screen. To you back home, hope to see you soon. Okay, thank you, Eivin. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, guide us all through the next 50 minutes, uh, six presentations. Um, so biology of uh, farmed fish is really at the core uh, for success in aquaculture. Um, and for aquaculture to be sustainable, uh, we depend on really understanding how fish biology dictate all technology developments. That's the topic of today. So we are excited to uh, present six examples uh, of Nofima's aquaculture research and innovations uh, with biology at the center uh, for developing sustainable aquaculture. So, uh, what's more natural than to start out with the economics uh, and how that influences, uh, or how biology influences uh, the economic results? So, scientist uh, Odun Iversen is today's first speaker. His field of expertise is economics within seafood industries. Uh, and his presentation is addressing the fact that uh, high production cost can challenge the industry uh, from being profitable. So, his title is Salmon Farming, The Troubled Adventure. So, Odun, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Salmon farming is in many ways an adventure. From the outset in the 60s or 70s, it was at most expected to be something to do on the side for small farmers. Today, it's one of the primary export industries in Norway and one of the most research-intensive research industries as well. Some of its importance lies in this. 55,000 people employed in salmon farming and its related activities. 8,000 in farming of small and grown out fish, 6,000 in processing. But salmon farming is so much more than this. The industry relies heavily on a range of specialized goods and, and services, adding up to these 55,000. In recent years, as an example, in recent years, ex <coughs> investment has increased rapidly. A lot is invested in small plants, as we see here, but we see the same development in, in the sea phase of salmon farming, with even more investment. To identify all 55,000, we have mapped suppliers more fully than previously, covering both investment and the exports from suppliers, which are not included in ordinary ripple, uh, ripple effect analysis. We estimate a value creation of 3.5 million NOC per man year in the actual fish farming production. And that is an awful lot. It is actually close to five times the national average for value creation per person. Five times. Uh, even if we consider the entire industry, uh, the, including its suppliers, the average is around uh, a million and a half, or two times the average for national value creation per person. The total value creation in the industry, including its suppliers, is around 79 billion NOC. This is an important reason, along with fisheries, that the smallest and most peripheral municipalities in Norway are today the most, or the ones with the highest value creation per man year in Norway. 
But when ripple effects are huge, it is partly because the costs of production are high. So that's kind of a, of a dilemma. Before I go any further into the cost increase, uh, let's look at cost in a longer perspective. Costs of farming fell for, for many years, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the result of research, innovation, and scale, of course. But at some point, it reversed, and costs started to increase. Uh, this cost increase might seem like a paradox when we know that the industry is increasingly advanced, with more automation and improved control of most aspects of farming. Here, for example, at uh, Norlox, five people control the feeding for 17 or 18 sites. Technology, technology development has been immense in this industry, and it still is. The green curve shows that uh, for many years, labor cost per kilo fell as production per employee increased, shown by the blue curve. But even with, with all this technology, it's still t it's the increase from 2009 till today means that it's today it costs 80% more in labor. We use 80% more labor to, to produce a salmon than 10 years ago. Uh, there is or there must be an, under, an underlying productivity growth, but this is where we see the effect of biological challenges. Looking at costs, these have more or less doubled since 2005. But why is this? Let's have a look at some of the drivers be behind the cost development. Before moving on to license disease, I must mention feed. As feed makes up so much of the cost, feed prices and feed conversion ratio becomes key figures, where lice and disease contribute by increasing the feed conversion ratio which should ideally be lower. We are still at a level quite above the Faroe Islands, who for the last 15 years has been the benchmark. One reason is mortality, which is close to 20%. Not the highest in the industry, but certainly not the lowest either. Mortality is of course expensive, but more importantly, it's an indicator of serious health or welfare issues. Lice treatment is one cause, along with a range of diseases. Uh, it is hard to calculate the cost of disease, but the cost of lice we have been able to calculate quite closely. Dire direct, lice cost, direct lice cost was more than four knock per kilo in 2020, or around six billion for the industry as a whole. A few years ago, pharmaceuticals was the dominant cost. Now medication-free treatments are taking over, while the cost of cleaner fish is still High. On the positive side, research, research has helped manage or, or eradicate some diseases. IPM has been strongly reduced, PD, CMS, HSMB are, are still occurring frequently, and ISA occurs at a low frequency. But we should worry that it more than doubled from 2019 to 2020. Research on disease is just one research area, but a good example that salmon farming has become a very research-intensive industry, but surely even more research is needed. This figure shows the increase in R&D since 2001, a solid increase indeed. And we also notice that the share of privately financed R&D is at almost 55%. So in short, salmon farming is an industry with huge value creation, even though costs have made yet another jump. We see strong innovation and we see an underlying productivity growth that is kind of drowning in biological challenges. We will not fully enjoy all the technological development that is taking place until we can solve or reduce the biological challenges facing the industry. From management literature, some of you may remember the old postulate, cult culture eats strategy for breakfast. For the aquaculture industry, I think we can rewrite this into biology eats technology for breakfast. Thank you. Thank you, Audun. So now we will move on to uh, uh, the biology of one of the technologies uh, to tackle sea lice, uh, cleanfish. 
Uh, Nofima's fish health, health scientist Lil Heidi Johansen, please, uh, will present her work with uh, the presentation Several Improvements Possible in the Use of Lumpfish. So, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. The term cleaner fish is used as a collective term for various species of wrasse and wild caught and farmed and farmed lumpfish. These are kept together with Atlantic salmon in cages for them to graze salmon lice and thus be used as a control strategy against lice. The use of cleaner fish in Norway has increased rapidly since 2010 and from 2017 between 50 to 60 million cleaner fish have been put in salmon cages annually. Farmed lump fish is by far the most numerous fish used as cleaner fish in Norway. Although its effect as a control measure has been uh, questioned, many fish farmers experience positive effects of cleaner fish to control lice, and scientifically based evidence for this effect is also starting to be published. However, too many cleaner fish die during their stay in salmon cages. The Norwegian Food Safety Authority's cleaner fish campaign ending in 2019 resulted in the first major statistical anal analysis of mortality figures. The registered mortality was 42%, but since any remaining share of cleaner fish put to sea cannot be accounted for at the end of production, the actual mortality figures can be much higher. The Norwegian Food Safety Authority concluded that the aquaculture industry has little control over the cleaner fish and that many cleaner fish die. This cannot continue. The industry has a big job to do and must document a significant improvement if they are to continue to use cleaner fish in the future. The survey among farmers showed that non-medicinal delicing and diseases are considered the most common causes of death among farmed lumpfish together with other types of handling and operations like mechanical defouling of nets. But the percentage of unknown causes of death is also high. Actually, a clear challenge is that the different cleaner fish species have different needs and life strategies that are very different from the salmon. Research during the last 10 years has increased knowledge, but still much is unknown about their basic biology and needs. Operational procedures prior to treatment of salmon involves removal of cleaner fish from the cages. But this is not 100% effective, and cleaner fish often go through the same delicing processes as salmon. So why do lumpfish seem to be more vulnerable to delicing procedures than the salmon? In Nofima, we have employed cell cultures, histology, and transcriptomics to study how lumpfish skin respond to common delicing methods like chemical treatment using hydrogen peroxide and thermic delicing. The characteristic bone plates or spikes of lumpfish are covered with a skin cell layer which may easily be damaged during different handling procedures. This may leave the lumpfish more vulnerable to infections through the damaged areas. We find these damages also from hydrogen peroxide-treated lumpfish. In addition, the skin, of, uh, the skin cells of treated fish uh, have delayed migratory capacity, which may lead to reduced wound healing capacity. Thermic delicing causes changes in the skin that has earlier been connected to stress in other fish species. So overall, our results suggest that lumpfish may develop secondary or long-term effects of the lice treatment, which can challenge the health and welfare of the fish. Indeed, farming practices need to be further developed and optimized if lumpfish are to be used as cleaner fish in the future. But the survey from the Food and Safety Authorities and information from farmers show that some are succeeding very well and have reduced the mortality levels dramatically. Bioreja farming is one of several examples when it comes to successful use of lumpfish as cleaner fish. Lice treatments have been re reduced drastically or postponed in their farms due to the use of lumpfish, and important factors have been the dedicated personnel focusing on the lumpfish, strategic planning choosing the most suited time points for transfer of lumpfish to salmon cages, and deciding on the number of lumpfish needed to achieve effective lice control. 
To avoid mortalities and reduce welfare, lumpfish should be used when temperatures are relatively low in late autumn, winter, and spring. They should be removed from the cages when temperatures rise in summer and the need for mechanical delicing of larger salmons tend to increase. They see less or no increase of mortality of lumpfish in cages that have not been delicized suggesting that cause of mortality might be a combination of handlings, treatments, and suboptimal temperatures. They focus on improved systems and routines for registration of health status and mortality, optimization of feeding methods, and improving procedures to recapture lumpfish. Bjørøya participate uh, actively in R&D projects like the Cyclus project and the Cleaner Fish Coordinator project, which increase their competence continuously. Here we see a male lumpfish ready for spawning. The example of Atlantic salmon that has been bred since the 1970s show that breeding is key to succeed with new species in aquaculture. Lumpfish production still relies on the capture of wild broadfish, and so most lumpfish used in salmon cages are still direct offspring of wild fish. Thus, newly started lumpfish breeding programs are important to succeed in the future. Important research topics are also, for example, vaccines and nutrition. And quick implementation and sharing of gain knowledge is key. And when the lumpfish has ended its job as lice eater, it should be still looked upon as a valuable resource, also a protein resource. Some recent examples from uh, research and experience-based knowledge are the review of welfare indicators of lumpfish, the revised guidelines for the best practice in use of cleaner fish, and research into recatch, killing, and after-use. Also, a large project on sustainable exploitation of lumpfish has been initiated very recently. Summed up, by improving practices for the use of cleaner fish to secure their health and welfare, it is possible, but this must happen very fast is if the use of cleaner fish is to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we move on swiftly to the next speaker. So, with COVID uh, vaccines, their effects and their side effects uh, is more on the agenda than ever. And uh, this is also the case for vaccines for farmed uh, Atlantic salmon. Um, senior scientist Grete Bebefjord, uh, she has decades of experience with fish skeletal deformities. And her presentation today has the title Cross-Stitch Vertebral Deformities, a new side effect of vaccination. So please, Grete, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I will give you a short and simplified version of a long and complicated story. This is about skeletal deformities as a new and unexpected side effect of vaccination against pancreas disease. Uh, in 2021, we all know so much more about vaccine side effects than what we did just one year ago. We have learned that all vaccines have side effects and that the severity and incidence of side effects need to be weighed against the protection they provide. But in the growth and development of salmon farming, vaccines were a major success factor. Severe diseases were brought under control and the use of antibiotics was reduced to almost nothing. Skeletal deformities, on the other hand, is a well-known problem in salmon production. Through the years, we have found that most cases relate to high temperatures or low mineral supply or a combination of the two. But a link to vaccination was also indicated in the early 2000s. Then, in 2016 17 a new high of skeletal deformities emerged out of the blue, the cross-stitch vertebrae. The deformities were seen in harvest sized fish and they were severe and caused uh, uh, big losses. 
Fish producers quickly pointed to a new vaccine product, which was uh, introduced to the market in 2015, an oil adjuvanted vaccine, which included a PD component. On X-ray, the lesions were quite distinct, and we recognized them from uh, an experimental study that we had done a few years before. We also knew that this condition was indeed something specific and that it had a relation to vaccines. Uh, we started a project and we started with fish sampled at harvesting plants. Material was collected from seven different sites along the western coast and we also collected relevant information from a total of 150 harvest groups for analysis. On histology, we found a key to what was going on. In vertebrae, with the typical X-ray pathology, we found defects in the vertebral end plates. The defects were circular around the vertebral body with a near identical distance from the center. Production data confirmed that vaccine product was a major risk factor and that zero plus molds had a higher risk for developing the condition than one plus. But there was also a huge variation in severity even between comparable fish groups from zero to 40-50% affected fish in any group. Uh, the next thing we did was to test four different vaccine treatments in a long-term fish experiment. The first was a group of fish with no injection. The second, vaccination with a standard product with no PD component. Group three and four were the two oil adjuvanted vaccines with PD component on the market at the time. But as often happens, problems tend not to appear when you look for them and the fish in our experiment remained painfully normal throughout. But at harvest, we did find fish with cross-stitch pathology, and they were all found in the two groups vaccinated with PD component. On histology, we did find signs of change in bone produced just after vaccination. Two weeks post-vaccination, we found fibrin deposits located in the growth zone. The bone-producing cells were irregular and contained substances which indicated cellular stress. This is how vertebrae grow. Each vertebra starts as a tiny hourglass-shaped structure which looks like an X inside view. The growth zone is located along the rim of the hourglass or at the tip of the arm or the X inside view. If the growth zone is disturbed and produces a weak spot, this weakness will remain in approximately the same position as the bone continues to grow. In subsequent samplings, we were able to track binary defects and irregularities in bone quality on histology, and the distance from the vertebral center remained uh, constant, near constant. At harvest, we found the typical changes on X-ray and on histology. We found the same kind of ring-formed perforations of the vertebral end plates that we saw in the field material. The distance from the center corresponded to the size of the vertebrae at vaccination. We believe that these vaccines induce a reaction in the vertebral growth zone which may be embedded in the bone as a hidden weakness. Then other factors determine whether or not the vertebral body has enough strength or suffers a breakdown when the fish increases in body mass. We still don't know, is it the PD component or something else? We found some signs of the same reaction also in the fish which received the standard vaccine with no PD component but it was weaker and with no bone pathology on X-ray. So maybe this is a generic reaction to oil adjuvanted fish vaccines, 
just so much stronger with some products. And then there is factor X. Why are some fish groups badly affected and comparable groups much less? We have no firm answers, but we do have indications that water temperature following seawater transfer may play a role. And this makes sense uh, when uh, considering the difference between zero plus and one plus. Uh, the cross-stitch deformities were a very unwelcome surprise when they first appeared, and they have caused uh, both fish suffering and economic losses. The good news is that this is a problem with a very well-defined starting point, and as such, it should be possible to resolve. So, thank you for the attention. Thank you. So, uh, Nofema scientist Gareth Difford uh, used different types of uh, technologies actively in his research on breeding and genetics on farmed animals and fish. And his presentation today uh, is on feed utilization and how more efficient utilization of feed reduces cost and footprint. So, please, Gareth. Good afternoon. This talk begins, like so many others, with feed. Feed is the single largest operational cost in Atlantic salmon farming production, accounting for more than 50%. But what you may not also know is that it accounts for more than 70% of the carbon footprint. Together, these two facts give us a clear win-win opportunity through improving feed efficiency. That is, identifying and selecting fish that grow well but require less feed to do so. And yet, out of the big livestock production industries, aquaculture, including Atlantic salmon, lags behind because we're the only industry to not actively and directly select for more feed efficient stocks. There are a number of reasons for this, but they all boil down to the fact that it's extremely technically challenging to determine how much feed each individual salmon eats a day at sea when you have hundreds of thousands of them. But one method which gained traction in the 80s and the 90s is the X-ray method. In this method, you include radio-opaque markers or beadlets in the pellets, you feed them to your salmon, you X-ray them, and you can count the beadlets, and from that you can determine how much they eat. And there's an example in rainbow trout behind me. But for a number of reasons, this technology did not reach a suitable technology readiness level, and it was never industrially applied. Today I'm going to tell you what has changed since the 80s and 90s, and how we at Nofema have given this method a technological facelift. X-ray has come a long way from printed radiography to the point where we can now precisely and with high resolution image soft tissues in small Atlantic salmon, and they are portable solutions for larger fish cage side. We now have the power of genomics at our fingertips, and through genomic selection, we can more precisely identify elite genetic material, and we can do this with measuring less fish, so we can cut costs. With the explosion in machine learning and deep learning algorithms, it's now trivial to segment out objects in an image. For example, radio-opaque markers in an X-ray. We've come a long way since the pelleting press used to originally make the pellets with radio-opaque markers. Now we're using modern extruders, which use increasing temperature and pressure to give us a superior quality pellet with higher digestibility. That's fantastic for nutrition, not so good for our radio-opaque markers. So we had to source tougher materials to survive this process. At Nofema's Feed Technology and Nutrition Group in Bergen, we successfully produced extruded feeds with radio-opaque markers. And at Nofema's Center for Sustainable Recirculation, Aquaculture, and Sundelsura, we've successfully live x-rayed thousands of Atlantic salmon from our partner Movies Breeding Nucleus 
with good growth and low mortalities. We now produce higher resolution digital x-rays faster than ever before. And with our machine learning algorithms, it's easy to rapidly quantify how many beads are in the x-ray and how much our fish are eating. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to say that for the first time, we have produced reliable genomic breeding values for feed intake and feed efficiency in Atlantic salmon. Every dot in the graph behind me is an Atlantic salmon, and every one below the solid line requires less feed. Those on the extreme left have below average genetic potential for growth, and those on the extreme right have good genetic potential for growth. By selecting fish that grow well but require less feed, the fish in the green box, we can calculate what would happen if we selected. And after three generations of selection, a conservative estimate is that FCR can be improved by 10%. That means a saving of 1.5 to 2 billion knock per annum and a decrease in carbon footprint of 7%. But there is a catch. We've done this in land-based facilities, in freshwater par, up to seawater post-malt. For this technology to be ready and relevant, we have to go to sea. And we believe at Nafima that this technology is ready to take the next step for a more profitable and sustainable solution to Atlantic salmon farming in Norway. And if you'd like to read more, my colleague Björn Hutland has recently published a chronicle in Intrafish. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, new production systems uh, are driving technology development of salmon farming. And uh, the speaker, uh, the next speaker is leading the SFI Control Aqua. Uh, this is a center for research-driven innovation of land-based farming with recirculation in aquaculture and semi-closed production systems in sea. Um, Sustainable aquaculture also in these systems depend on good fish welfare. And senior scientist Åsa Esmark, uh, she will be the next speaker. Uh, not even a broken foot will stop her to talk about fish welfare in semi-closed containment systems. So um, her title is How is welfare in semi-closed containment systems at sea? This is perfectly timed for you to come up here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, clicker is there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Penta. So let me start by saying that I am concerned about fish welfare with the use of new aquaculture production systems. But I also want to say that in general, the welfare in the semi closed systems is good, but there are still room for improvements because there are some knowledge gaps. We wish to find reliable welfare indicators so that we objectively can see, say, how the fish is coping in the systems that we provide them with. We also prefer to measure welfare in real time so that the conditions can be improved while there is still time for improvement. But why do we need new aquaculture production systems? To enable sustainable growth in aquaculture, we need technologies that prevent the challenges that the industry is still facing, namely lice and escapees. We also need technologies that enable production at different locations for the best sustainable utilization of our country. So from this slide you can see that we can produce fish on land in open net pens, in offshore installations at sea, and also in the semi-closed containments closer to land. This requires equal regulations and conditions for all technologies that are proven for health, welfare and environment. I will now focus on the semi-closed systems that are floating systems in sea uh, where a physical barrier prevents the lice from getting in and also preventing the fish from escaping. Many independent investigations have proven that these systems work as intended. First, they are very efficient against lice, and also in the systems that we have looked into, the conditions inside the system is creating very good growth. 
<laughs> from the semi-close preline system, a mass thesis showed that velocity-mediated training most likely was the reason for why the fish also grew better after leaving the semi-close system compared to fish that have grown their own, the whole life in open net pens. But even though the growth is good, this does not necessarily mean that the welfare is fulfilled. So how is the welfare in the semi-closed systems and how can we monitor it? Fish are dependent on strong and healthy skin that protects them against diseases and wounds. Here in this slide to the left you see a skin as we see it through the microscope of a fish before it entered a semi-closed system, and you can see that the, uh, the surface is rough and almost missing. After two months inside the system, the skin improved to how, what you can see to the right of the, in this slide, and you see that the, the surface is intact and smooth. This improvement can be due to the good conditions in the system, but we also know that fish skin gets thicker and more robust with age. So protecting the fish uh, while the skin is improving, they can also be more um, suited to, uh, to cope with the, uh, with the environment once it gets out. External morphology traits are important operational welfare indicators. And to monitor this, we can use scoring. And you may have seen this uh, fish well scoring system that describes how we can evaluate the fish manually with the different, uh, many different morphological uh, traits. However, manual scoring has some drawbacks. First, you need to take the fish out of the water. It's a subjective evaluation that also needs trained personnel. And finally, the conclusions are based on a relatively small part of the population, thus not giving a whole picture of the whole group. One way to come around these limitations is the use of machine learning. Here, exemplified with the Control Aqua SFI partner, CreateView. By feeding the camera with pictures or traits that you want the camera to detect, the camera will be trained to uh, be able to recognize targeted fish. To monitor skin health, uh, the camera may be fed with pictures of skin with different conditions. From healthy skin, as you can see in the lower part of this slide, to more injured skin, uh, with scale loss and wounds, as you see in the upper side of this slide. The camera learns how skin with different skin conditions look like, and after some training, the, the camera will be able to objectively recognize injured fish without the need to sacrifice individuals. One final example of how we can monitor welfare is the use of internal tags. And here I would like to mention the heart rate monitoring tags. Implementing these tags needs to be done by trained personnel in order to avoid post-operational uh, injuries. However, even though how rough this looks like in this slide, all fish in this experiment survived and performed well after surgery. These tags not only allow us to monitor physiological traits, they also gives us a unique possibility to follow fish for a long time and record welfare during husbandry practices. We can, for instance, uh, detect uh, failures in pumps, uh, failures in water quality or feeding systems without us being present. So from what we have seen so far, the welfare in the semi-closed systems are satis is satisfactory. And we have some good methods for monitoring but there are room for improvements and there are knowledge gaps. We still have work to do in order to find out how to move big fish in and out of these systems. And there are a need for knowledge regarding water and waste treatment and how to do these processes for the best for the fish and at lower costs. With tight collaboration between R&D, industry and legislations, we believe that the semi closed systems will contribute highly to future aquaculture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, 
We now only have one uh, presentation left. Uh, and just to remind you uh, from uh, the media or other who would like to discuss with uh, the present, uh, presenters afterwards, they will be here in this room or uh, down at our stand, uh, at Nofima stand afterwards. So uh, climate change is happening uh, and seafood can be part of the solution uh, for more sustainable food. But climate change will uh, increasingly have consequences on the way we produce food in the world, uh, on land, in waters and in the oceans. Fish farming is no exception. So the next speaker, Nofima scientist Alf Selene Stalum, he is a fish health expert, and his very valid question here for the final presentation is, can we maintain good fish health in a changing climate? So please, Alf, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. As a model on fish health, I want to use the gill. Due to its delicate structure, large surface, and extensive interaction with the environment, it is one of the most environmental sentient and fastest responding tissue of the fish. And this is what a healthy gill should look like. Now, while technology, if used right and adapted to the fish biology, can help us to improve fish and gill health, Unfortunately, it seems like climate changes will continue to tighten the screw on the total negative load on fish health. So first, I will give three examples on how technological innovation challenge fish biology. And this is important because it's this technology that will be part of the solution in order to adapt to climate changes. Starting at the beginning, the fundament for successful production in sea is laid down in the freshwater phase. Today, RAS technology has to a large extent taken over for flow-through systems. Although offering several advantages like better utilization of freshwater resources, it also adds considerable complexity to the production cycle. One major challenge and concern is the daily fluctuation in water quality. Here, exemplified by the fluctuation of carbon dioxide across a fish tank over a period of six days. Although the absolute level of CO2 is within acceptable levels, the fl these fluctuations actually represent a significant stressor to the fish and to the gills. Fish can adapt to rather harsh conditions, as long as they are stable. It is the abrupt fluctuations that are damaging the fish. Stressed gill is a common finding uh, for fish experiencing rapidly changing water quality. And uh, we believe that technological solutions should be put in place so that the production system buffers these fluctuations. Moving to the sea, biofouling of net pens is already a challenge, and the challenge is expected to increase with increasing water temperatures. Today, a common method to handle this is based on high-pressure water flushing of the net pen wall. With the seawater current tra transporting the debris in a random pattern, often into the net pen and in contact with the fish. Several cases of sudden increase in gill damages in the aftermath of net pen cleaning has been recorded. And we believe that measures should be taken to avoid the biofouling debris getting in contact with the fish. Technically, this should be a simple task. As already mentioned today, sea lice is a major challenge in salmonid aquaculture of today. And again, the challenge is estimated to increase with increasing water temperature. In order to fight this parasite, huge investments have been made in new technology. And I think it is fair to say that it would not be possible to run the aquaculture business in Norway as it is today without these solutions. However, 
The design and operation, particularly of early prototypes, was flawed with several suboptimal uh, solutions, posing, in some instances, extensive damages to the surface of the fish, including the gills. And I believe that a closer cooperation between engineers and fish health personnel could have avoided these incidents. Although treatment of fish with these new methods still represent a substantial stressor to the fish, I think that it represent a good example on how technology can be improved when engineers and biologists work together to find the best solution. And my hope is that this can inspire for early involvement of fish health personnel in the technological development to take place. So, climate changes, looking at the climate. Climate changes, together with disturbances in the marine ecology, is estimated to change the dynamics of algae and harmful algae blooms. Also, environmental stress is expected to bring about an increased toxin production of the algae. In case of an upcoming algae bloom, several protective measurements could be put in place. But in order to do so, innovations in terms of early warning systems. So, trying to wrap things up, a sobering fact. Climate changes are happening now, as we speak. Technological innovation can help us to adapt aquaculture production to these changes, but importantly, the technology has to be on the premises of biology and not the other way around. Gill health in aquaculture is an increasing concern, with seemingly increasing length of gill seasons every year. And for, as an example, it is no longer unusual to see amoebic gill disease midwinter on the western coast of Norway. What is driving this? It's hard to tell. But Impact from climate changes and suboptimal technological solution should be in a focus. We must never forget the famous word of the founding father, Benjamin Franklin, stating that by failing to prepare, we are preparing to fail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have now come to a close. Uh, thank you all who have uh, joined us here uh, in Trondheim and for you who have followed us uh, digitally. Uh, I hope that these six examples uh, from uh, Nofima's research portfolio in aquaculture has given some inspiration and maybe new ideas. And if you would like to uh, if you have questions for uh, our researchers or um, would like to discuss, uh, they will be here now after, immediately after this, is, uh, this seminar is uh, finished and then afterwards also down at the stand A132, Nofima's stand. So hope to see you there and thank you all. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>